Hi. Um, this is going to be a hard one for me to do. I just tried earlier today to do this video, and I got very anxious. I'm 57, and I have watched this nation carefully and observed from a dispassionate position what goes on in the halls of power. I mean, sorry, government. And what I have seen more often than not, and I mean a lot more often than not, is that people seeking wealth and power gravitate to the White House, to Congress, to the Senate, to state senates, to the position of governor, and many other positions. Um, and oftentimes these people are not swayed by moral and ethical considerations. They don't have a better nature. You can't, you can't appeal to their better nature. You can appeal to their greed. You can appeal to how it'll make them look good. You can appeal to how, if they don't, it's going to hurt them and it's going to be very visible so that it'll hurt them. Um, you can do all kinds of things to persuade or motivate or dissuade them. But when you give them a moral or ethical argument, they're either going to pretend to care or they're just going to show you they don't care. And I'm not saying that all politicians are like that. There are some legitimately good politicians. Unfortunately, the list of good politicians and great politicians is very short. And the list of people with mental illnesses that cause them to seek out immeasurable amounts of wealth and power is very long. And people get into that mindset, that mental illness, and there are several mental illnesses that lead people to seek ultimate power, that lead them to seek uh, insane amounts of wealth um, or both, including narcissism, uh, psychopathy, megalomania, and monomania. This is legitimately one or more mental illnesses that are propelling them into positions of having not even obscene amounts of wealth and power, but totally unconscionable and destructive amounts of wealth and power, such that they can destroy a nation by the decisions they make that they can control most of the nations in the world directly or indirectly. And I'm not saying that they're all American, because they're not. There are wealthy people all over the world who are mentally ill, and they're so obsessed with wealth and power that they will do anything to get more, including torture, uh, illegal theft of property that they made legal by altering the legal landscape in their favor, um, and even murder, kidnapping, disappearing people, all that kind of stuff. I mean, if we look at the history of America, when Hoover was the head of the FBI, he actively worked to undermine movements from groups of people that he did not like. He was very discriminatory, very prejudicial, and he broke the law. And when United Fruit Company was having problems with the citizens of the countries that they were in, rebelling against them, even, and this was because they had propped up di dictators um, who were uh, enslaving the local populations or parts of the local populations that were uh, less favorable ethnic groups, um, including torture, uh, in permanent imprisonment, and murder. The... Um, 
the owner of United Fruit went to the head of the CIA and said, look, I need your help because if you don't do something, um, they're going to force change in this country that I basically run where my fruit comes from primarily. And that means that uh, the stocks are going to go down. Now, that immediately motivated the head of the CIA at the time, and I forgot his name. Sorry, you have to look it up. Because he was a major stockholder. And so he sent the CIA in to help the dictatorship to torture and murder these ethnic groups. Even when the majority of the citizens of the country wanted to overthrow the dictator, the CIA helped the dictator. And this is a, not an isolated incident. If we look again and again and again, America, instead of doing what we say we do, which is you know, encouraging freedom and democracy throughout the world, what America has actually done over and over again in many, many countries, including the Philippines, Iran, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Panama, and many, many other, I, I can't even remember the list. The list is very, very long. America has gone in through, and through one means or multiple means, including economic uh, manipulation, coups, assassinations, uh, military interventions, um, supporting the rebels, and they have propped up people who, at the time, Washington viewed as allies in a common cause. Now, whether that common cause was stated as being weapons of mass destruction or communism or something else, ultimately, in almost every case, the underlying motivation had to do with the acquisition of wealth, resources, and power. A lot of what happened in many of these countries was motivated by getting more oil, by getting control. If you look at the countries that America has active partnerships with that are dictatorships, such as Saudi Arabia, that support terrorists, such as Saudi Arabia, you'll see a long list of countries that commit horrible human rights violations and America lets it happen and doesn't even invade and not only that but America actually will funnel money and weapons and training to these countries that are committing horrible crimes because why because certain elite people in this country and maybe a certain other countries in Europe are benefiting financially that is the real America. When we talk about the military of this country, or any country, if you look at history, the vast majority of the time when a military is active, it was not because they wanted to be in the military, it was because their king said, you must, or I will imprison you, or I will kill you, or whatever. They were drafted into the military, forced to fight a war that had nothing to do with them, and often was petty fights between royalty of different nations and uh, money grabs and land grabs and things that benefited almost nobody except for the aristocracy and the royalty or if it, there was no longer a royalty and an aristocracy and the, then it was the, um, the bourgeoisie or the, the people who were very, very rich, basically, who often were... Um, not just like merchants and stuff, but the former royals and aristocrats of that nation and remain to this day in positions of excessive amounts of wealth and power. And so with the exception, certain exceptions where a military had to be raised to fight an invading force, whether it was the motherland or like when America fought Britain, or it was an invading nation, um, most of the time, 
there was a profit motive behind it. Even with invasions, there was often a profit motive behind it. And the vast majority of the time that America has intervened in another country's, it had to do with money, resources, and or power. So, you know, we talk about make America great again, and I want America to be great. Um, I'm not sure when America stopped being great. I think it's been a really long time since before I was born in some ways, and more recently after I was born uh, and even after I was an adult and even after I was a middle-aged man uh, before other things started to happen. But I have noticed significant, very negative changes. The quality of education has gone down. The morality and ethics of this country have been eroded. The behavior of the elite has been aided and abetted by all three branches of the government to the point that corporations are now considered citizens. There are members of the Supreme Court who are, in my opinion, criminals and are only there for money and power and they serve whoever gives them a lot of money. And they are typically, sorry, conservatives. And they have worked to not only erode rights that help everybody, but they also have eroded protections that stopped them from being corrupted. So they passed a common law edict, I guess you could say, in which they said, oh, no, no, no. These things that we're talking about, that we say are corruption, that's not corruption. That's, that's okay. We can take that. We can take that money. We can take those gifts. That's not illegal. They gave themselves the power to legalize corrupt behavior, behavior that corrupts them, and that helps people with money and power to get what they want. And again, we're talking about mentally ill people in the Supreme Court and behind the scenes who are paying these people in the Supreme Court to make decisions that are based on gifts. The Supreme Court recently created a code of ethics, but there is no oversight from Congress. And technically speaking, the Supreme Court answers to Congress and the president, um, but mostly to Congress. Because if there is a question of improper behavior by a Supreme Court justice or justices, that is supposed to be handled by Congress. But because of very strong partisan behavior, when a justice is... a engaging in illegal behavior, making illegal decisions, the party in power will protect that judge or that justice from consequences. So there is no justice. There is no way for the statement in the Constitution which says they may continue throughout their life to be a justice on the condition of good behavior. There's no enforcement of that good behavior clause because it was never fleshed out until recently and it was never assigned ownership aside from the justices themselves. So when Clarence Thomas has repeatedly accepted gifts of money, of tuition for his kids, of boats, uh, RVs, and things like that, that's all been legal because he and his buddies made it legal. So when Alito has committed crimes as a justice, it's all okay. Because the people in power are protecting the justices who are giving them what they want, who get money in return and gifts in return. Now, if that isn't corruption, I don't know what is. 
And then we look at Congress and the Senate. And those two parts of the legislative branch are full of con artists, scammers, criminals, drunks, pedophiles, narcissists, psychopaths, and other scum of the earth. I'm not saying all of them are, because they're not all. There are some people there who have very good intentions, some who think they have very good intentions, but are misguided. And then there are the ones who are just playing out and out in it for the money and the power. Did you know that there are laws, or were, that protected us from this avarice? But see, here's the problem with democracy. When the people become complacent or they become discouraged and stop, stop participating, that opens the doors wide to all of the criminally minded and mentally ill people who want to take advantage of the system for themselves. Because a democracy only functions when the citizens constantly are vigilant and educated and watching like a hawk what their leaders are saying and doing and being very careful about leaders who are psychologically manipulative. And oh my gosh, the degree of psychological manipulation I see in campaigns and the corruption that goes on behind the scenes is sickening. But they don't care. And they know that when you see this, that you're going to be discouraged and you're going to stop voting. Or, or you will become a target for manipulation in which you will have a hero who steps up and says, you know what? This is not good. We need to fix this. I'm going to fix it for you. I'm your hero. I'm, the one, I'm going to be the one who will get it done. And they will, this person will crucify themselves, make themselves look like a saint, um, and behave in such a way that they emotionally trigger you, if you're one of those people, again and again and again, so that you have no way to get beyond your emotions and use your logic and see that you're being manipulated. Because that's how con artists work. And in my life, I've run across a fair number of con artists in person, and some I've just seen working their magic on either an individual, group, or mass level. And it, they're easy to identify because they will play on your emotions. They don't talk about numbers so much as they talk about your hopes and your fears and your greed. They prey on this, the data that has been collected by polls about what people are upset about, about, about people, what people are afraid of, and about what people want. And these people who want money and power, they don't care what it is you want. They're going to give it to you because in return, you're going to give up things like rights because you think they're going to help you. And in a way, they will. But they'll also be robbing you at the same time. I'm not going to name names of politicians who are doing this and some who have been doing it for decades. I'm just suggesting that when you listen to politicians, you should be fact-checking, and if the facts don't match, then you should be asking yourself some very serious questions. Because when you see somebody saying, these are the facts, and then you go to the source, and it's different or the opposite, that is a big honking red flag that you are being conned. Unfortunately, a lot of people, because of the downslide of 
our society. And I'm not talking us, uh, about morality and ethics here. I'm talking about the decisions that have often been made by the very people who are increasingly corrupting our government for their own benefit, be it the elites or corporations and multinational corporations. It, it doesn't matter because they're just going to keep taking and taking and taking because they want more and they can't stop because they're mentally ill. Their greed is all-consuming, and they will consume the world and not care. They will turn this planet into a dystopian nightmare that makes Blade Runner and The Day After and, the, and all those other movies look like heaven in their pursuit of wealth and power. So I beg you, I beg you, please, Americans, if you want America to be great, you have to wake up. You have to use logic, not emotions. You have to set your emotions be behind or beside. There's a time and a place. But when you're evaluating whether a politician is going to help you or hurt you, emotions can't get in the way. You must not trust people who are triggering your emotions. You must trust people who give you facts. And this is hard. This is hard for many people because our emotions are important to us. And I have had to teach myself to restrain my emotions using mindfulness so that I can properly consider things and understand when my understanding is wrong and accept correction from others. I do that. I have listened to people's opinions and allowed myself to consider, is it a valid point? Is it a logical point? Does it even make sense? And if all those three things are true and the facts back it up, then I can integrate that into my beliefs, my understanding of the world and what's good and what's bad for the nation. But when I get emotional, like when I was recording this video earlier, forget about it. And all of you are the same as me because we're humans. Now, some of you may have some very repressed emotions. You may not even understand your emotions. You may not believe you have emotions because you're so psychologically damaged from the abuse as a child that you have withdrawn yourself from the majority of your emotions with the exception usually of rage because abuse creates rage. That, you know, it's, it's just... It hard, very, very hard to say, okay, I just need to calm down. Okay, now, can you explain to me in simple terms and show me the proof? And here it becomes complicated because oftentimes the sources of proof are written by people who are very smart, very well educated, and they're not necessarily good at framing in a way that the average citizen can understand. And then there are the corporations and the elite people who finance doctors and lawyers and scientists who are unethical and also seeking wealth and power to lie to the public by producing false results. It isn't the doctors, lawyers, and scientists in general. It is this small group of people that you can't trust. And the problem is, is if you have been triggered by one of them, and, and most of them abuse the hell out of your emotions to get your money, to get your vote, to get your support, that it's very hard for you to realize that you are inside this cyclone of emotional abuse and manipulation. There are people who go decades sending money to criminals 
because they believe what they've been told because they've been manipulated so badly or they're so lonely for love that even six, seven, 10, 15 years later, the person they've never met, never had a voice chat with, only heard a voice or seen text messages and emails in some cases, will still believe and still send money. Even when the person says, I'm saving up that money you're sending, but I need more, I need more, I need more. <coughs> Let me tell you, when I was a young man, there were a couple of women who I thought were Russians, and I thought, you know, I had communicated with them on um, Friend Finder, I think it was, and there was a couple in the Philippines, and one in India, and the two that were supposedly Russian women. One was a very beautiful woman. Um, the other one was attractive also and had kids. They were tricking me into believing they were spending huge sums of money to be able to translate into English and then back into Russian our communications, and they, they didn't have enough money to afford it. Now, logically, you'd think, okay, if you don't have money to afford this, then why and how are you doing it? Now, the truth of it is, is it's a scam. And I eventually figured that out. Now, the first woman, I told her, the one with the kids, whom I had been planning to go and visit in Russia, I had... Um, told her, oh, by the way, I'm going to be losing my job because the company is going out of business. Suddenly, without warning, without, oh my God, what are you going to do? She was like, she cut off communication with me. She didn't want to have anything more to do with me. The other woman, whom I heard from sporadically, now, the first woman I had already sent money to to help pay for those translators and the fees of communication and stuff, that was all nonsense. It was a scam. But at least she had the, enough morality or ethics to say, oh, this guy's going to lose his job. I'm not going to rob him anymore. The second one, she didn't care. She wrote back and forth to me, and she started getting a little bit graphic. And then one day she sent nudes. And I sent some money, and then I was looking at one of the nudes, and I noticed something odd. There was this strange line going across her neck. I thought, wait a second. Uh-oh. And I looked really closely at it. And what they had done is they had found a nude of somebody, some other woman, and they had just taken the face of this woman that I was supposedly talking to and put those two pictures together. So what does that say? It says that I wasn't even talking to who I thought I was talking to. It was somebody else, probably a man, but could have been a woman, who had found pictures of a beautiful woman, found pictures of a sexy woman, put them together because he couldn't find pictures, naked pictures of the beautiful woman, and send them to me because a lot of times that makes men horny and then they're more willing to send money because they're like, oh gosh, yes, if I give her enough money, we'll see each other and we're going to be all day long. <laughs> and it's a dream because these, they choose women who are very, very, very attractive. And I figured it out. And I have learned it in my life through Mrs near misses and mistakes. How do I identify these things? Look. I wish I could just say, vote for whom you think is best. But the problem is, is many of us have been manipulated. I may even be somewhat manipulated, although I try to look at things with an open mind and be critical of the sources no matter what. But I can tell you this, that number one, the lesser of two evils logic is a lie because it doesn't matter which demon you choose. They're still demons. They'll still make life hell. Also, 
It is what the elites want you to do. And let me explain why. It's really very simple. A lot of the elites, like the Koch brothers, open, they, I don't know if it was openly admitted, but they admitted in some interviews that they were paying both Republican and Democratic candidates because they said, either way, I win. They were betting both sides. They don't care. A lot of these people don't care who wins because they've already bought their support. They have already put them into their pocket and said, here, you can suckle off my teat as long as you want, as long as you give me what I want. So they don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican or both because they win either way. Because so many people in those two parties are corrupted already. And some of the third parties are as well. But here's the thing. If you continue to vote for the two main parties that have allowed our country to decay, that have allowed through negligence or malignant behavior or both our country to become a greedy man, uh, person's free-for-all, then you are supporting what you say you are fighting. When you go into the military because you're patriotic, you're not supporting America. You are supporting the agenda of the elites that control the government, that control the military. When you vote for a Democrat or a Republican, you are supporting people who, to a large degree, are corrupt and don't care about us at all. Now, when I say us, I literally mean all of us. Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever. Baha'i, doesn't matter. Black, white, red, brown, yellow, green, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your sexuality in many cases. None of these things matter. All that matters is can they trick you into continuing to let them be in power? They're career politicians, and their goals do not align with yours unless you are vigilant and force them to comply with the will of the people, not the will of a minority that imposes its will on the majority. This is very important. One of the important things about a democracy is that everybody counts. And if a minority is saying, everybody one must obey this and do this, that is bad. And when a majority says, everyone must obey this, that is bad. But when they say, this is available, but you're not required to do it, that is okay in many cases. Not always. Free market, that is what the elite want. No regulations, that is what the elite wants. So the libertarians, they're saying smaller government, no regulation, they're really part of the elites, I would think. Don't you think so? Republicans want less regulation. They want free market. Democrats, well, they're so scattered and confused that half the time they're fighting each other instead of being unified and trying to make America great again. And I could go on and on and on. The point here is that we as American citizens whether you're an original American citizen, as in you were born here, or you are uh, and lived here all of your life, or you are an immigrant who has come here, because our ma our nation has built what was built by trampling the rights of the Native Americans, and was built by constant and routine influxes of immigrants. Your parents, or your grandparents, or your great grandparents 
My grandparents, some of the, uh, my, one of my aunts has trans, sorry, traced geneal genealogy. She has traced back to a, a, um, some kind of a minister named Brewer who was a founding member of one of the original colonies, uh, cities, I forget which one. So I have roots going very, very far back. And I'm kind of embarrassed because the guy was a lunatic and very, very unpleasant person, it turned out. But the point here is it doesn't matter how long you've been an American. We need to be vigilant to protect everyone's rights because, and we need to be unified because when we are allow ourselves to be divided, that is when the American public is at its weakest and the corruptors are at their strongest because this is an ages-old technique that has been used for millennia to take over and either destroy or uh, co-opt or subvert kingdoms, nations, religions. We as Americans cannot be discouraged. We must get out and vote. If you don't like what is happening in America, you need to get out and vote. Because by being discouraged, by giving up and saying, my vote doesn't count, you have made your vote not count. When your vote goes unheard, your vote doesn't count. Because you chose not to let it count. If enough poor people get out there and put out the vote and get to the voting booth and vote, we can change the course of history. We can change this country. Now, if you say, well, I don't want to vote Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or whatever other, you know, socialist or communist or whatever ist there, other ists there are, there's a long list of them, there is the third option. Well, there is a fourth option, but I think it's kind of silly. And that's, uh, the fourth option is writing in a candidate uh, like, say, Donald Duck or Oprah. What is more realistic is if a majority of citizens write in no confidence in the government on the ballots. That can be used to trigger the sections of our founding documents that allow us to reform the government. Yes, there are clauses in the founding documents, if you read them carefully, that explain that there is a way to fix it. Because at this point, the Supreme Court has more power than Congress and is routinely making laws and being supported by allies in Congress, in Senate, that prevent corrections being made so that people's rights are protected. And the executive branch has become more bolder and bolder and bolder in the abuse of executive orders. Executive orders aren't supposed to be like this blank check that you get to write and you get to order around everybody in the executive branch. You get to order around everybody in the government. No. That is not how it works. There are supposed to be restraints on executive decisions being made. But in the past few decades, I have seen more and more abuse of executive power overriding the considerations of especially Congress and Senate, but also sometimes overriding other bodies. I have seen the abuse of executive power to force entire branches of the government to comply with the political agenda of the reigning president or king. Same thing, really. I mean, think about it. You become president, you're guaranteed a million dollars a year for life, and you're guaranteed Secret Service 
protection for life. Do you realize how expensive that is for the American public? It is massively expensive. So think about it. Ronald Reagan is dead, but, and I think Carter is dead as well. So that means we've got Clint Bush and Clinton and Bush and uh, Obama and uh, Trump. I think that's all of them. We've got six presidents. That's $6 million plus, or is it, uh, is, yeah, I think it's a year, plus the massive cost of employing entire Secret Service teams and these teams are sworn to secrecy. They, if they see a current or former president breaking the law, they can't do anything about it. They are sworn to protect that person, even in the face of criminal activity. And now we're seeing that the Supreme Court is courting the recommendation to allow presidents to commit crimes while in office and be above the law. They're actually considering it. So that means that if, if the Supreme Court goes ahead, if you look at history, if you look at Pol Pot, if you look at uh, Mao Zedong, if you look at Xi Jinping, if you look at Hitler and Stalin and all of these other political lunatics who took over power, that is one of the things they did is they made themselves the supreme leader, they made themselves immune from prosecution, and then there were puppet elections in which the public voice was no longer counted. And they destroyed or subverted or perverted every law to benefit themselves and the people that were helping them. And that is what hap is happening in America and has been happening. This is, this is a long game, which is a con artist term for being willing to commit years and years for an immense payoff. And in this case, we're not talking about one or two con artists. We're talking about a huge number of people who stand to benefit even more while many of us don't get to eat enough food, while people go without medical support, they go, they, they go without a place to live and are abused by the police because they're homeless who treat them like garbage. They are put into debt, into debtor's prison because of parking tickets that they can't afford to pay because they can't earn enough money because they're put into a payment program that is so expensive, they end up owing, owing more money than they ever should have had to pay. And on and on and on the list goes. If you're tired of the way America is going, if you're tired of being trampled on by the rich, if you're tired of losing benefits, losing rights, if you're tired of being lied to, you have to vote. This is not the time to give up. Because I've learned in my life that when you just say, I give up, that is when it gets really bad. And the more Americans who give up, that means that the ones who are committed and are, feel like they're winning are going to be invigorated and have more energy to fight for what they want. Even if they're a tiny minority, they will impose their will on all of us. They will burn the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and other important documents. They will impose their political and or religious beliefs on the rest of us. They will jail or make invisible people who do not agree with them. They will assassinate. America, the United States of America, will cease to exist, and this will just become another autocratic or fascist nation led by greedy people. We will be no better than Putin or Xi Jinping or what's that idiot over North Korea or Turkmenistan or Kazakhstan or any of those other dictatorships. We will be just like them and we will suffer because we said, oh, 
It's too much work to fight. I don't have the energy. Trust me, if you don't get up and fight, and when I say fight, I don't mean violence, okay? Please, no violence. I mean fight through your vote. Fight through political action. Fight by using your brains. As long as you don't want to do that because it's too much work, that is what is going to happen to America. That is what has been happening to America. America has been turned into a, a nation hated by many nations because we invade nations left, right, and center. There has been almost no time in my life when America wasn't engaged in a military action in at least one country. Oftentimes, invading countries because they claimed it was about saving people, freeing people, but it was about wealth, resources, power, propping up dictators that would be willing to work with America. Get out the vote. Save America. We need to vote to let the government know that we do care about our lives. We do care about our future. And when somebody says, we cannot support the poor, well, the majority of Americans are the poor. So if they're not going to support us, and yet they're saying we need a bigger population, <laughs> You can't achieve that goal by killing everybody off by starvation and non-existent or poor medical care. There's a lot more that I can say, but I don't want to be accused of being partisan because I am not partisan. I love my country. I do not love my government because it is corrupt beyond belief. I beg you, please, please, get out and vote every chance you get. Pay attention to the track record of every politician, of every judge, of every medical examiner, of every sheriff. And every time you see warning signs of misbehavior, you vote those jerks out of office and put them up on charges. Prosecute them. Because I'll tell you what, if you don't, the, you think the police are bad now? <laughs> they will become a million times worse. And the Army the, and other branches of the military, and the Coast Guard included, will regularly be called to intervene in areas where they should not be. The CIA, the FBI, the NSA will be actively engaging in domestic espionage in support of the domestic terrorists and traitors that have infiltrated our government low and high. Get out the vote. Save our country. If you don't like the way our government is going, you need to vote. You need to speak up. You need to organize. Just be careful who you trust. Help me save America. Please. Thanks, and have a great day.